Amen.
<laughs> well, I found out that last Sunday on the uh, internet broadcast that I was the only one singing in the choir. How did I know that? Because this microphone had got left on and you couldn't hear nobody but me. So Homer is, Homer is standing, he's standing guard to turn me down when I don't do it myself. Revelation chapter 19 is where we're going today. In the last few weeks, we've kind of been talking about what's coming up next, what's coming up next, what's going to happen next. Well, today we come to the one that I've been just <laughs> chomping at the bits to get to. So we're going to talk about a, a marriage celebration. Now I know all, all you ladies especially, y'all need to perk up and stay awake today, all right? Y'all like weddings, right? Yeah, I know. You like the Hallmark Channel and all them wedding movies and marriages and so forth. Well... We're going to talk about the greatest marriage celebration of all today, all right? The marriage supper of the Lamb. It's in Revelation chapter 19, such a vivid and wonderful description of what it's going to be like in that day when we finally come to this great marriage in heaven. Now, folks, Jesus, if I hadn't convinced you by now, you need to be on your knees in prayer. Jesus is truly coming again. He is, he is going to return. It's going to be any day now. We're going to hear the, the trumpet sound. We're going to hear the shout of Christ. And we are going to face the throne of the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to happen. We talked about that. Those who are lost are going to face the, the great white throne judgment, which there again Jesus sits on the throne because all judgment has been put up in his hands. But that will be a horrible place to be. And I'm not going to be there. I'm going to be at the judgment seat of Christ to be rewarded according to my works. But now let's look in verses in 19, Revelation 19, beginning in verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia. Now that's the same as hallelujah. Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia! And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage supper of the, the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Let's pray. Father, bless your word in Christ's name. Amen. Here we go. All right. The great marriage in, he in heaven. And we hear that word, hallelujah or hallelujah, four different times in those first few verses of, 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 the, of the chapter 19. We hear those, you hear that repeated over and over again. And you're saying, wow, this is great. This is great. I've known this. But listen, did you know that that one word has the same meaning in every known language on the face of the earth. Every known language, hallelujah or hallelujah, means praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. So if you say you want to speak Portuguese this morning, that's fine. Just holler out, hallelujah, and you'll be saying praise the Lord in Portuguese. All right. Or French or any other. If you want to speak sweet nothings to your wife after supper tonight, just whisper, hallelujah. And she'll know you're talking French to her. All right. That'll really, that'll really help you out. So I just thought you might want to know that. All right, so it's, it's the same thing all over the world. When you say that, no matter where you are, everybody knows what you're talking about. And so when we see this beginning of chapter 19, and we see all the hallelujahs, and we hear everyone in the same voice just literally shouting, folks, heaven's going to get loud, all right? So just get ready for it. Don't, don't even think if you're going to go there that it's going to be quiet. No, 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 no. 
Heaven's going to get loud because the worship of Christ is going to be there, all right? The worship is going to be loud and boisterous when all of, imagine, all of the people who are gathered, all of the mighty multitude that is assembled, that has been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, that make up the church or the bride of Christ, are going to, as one voice, literally raise up and say, Hallelujah! And again, Hallelujah! It's going to be wonderful to hear as we see the, the face of Christ. We ought, to, we ought to be hallelujah in every day in our lives, all right? Because of all the remembrance of him, of all the things he's done for us, all the things he's given to us, we ought to praise his name. Thank God. Thank God we have that privilege to praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God that we have all these things that he has done for us, all the things that he has provided for us, all of the, all of the necessities of life, as well as our salvation, as well as our redemption, our forgiveness of our sins, all of this, for all, for all that he's done, we ought to just literally shout, Alleluia, every once in a while. Just literally look up to the heavens and bust out and say, Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Verse 1, after these things. After what things? After all the stuff that happens in Revelation. After the rapture of the church. After the time of tribulation. After the, the, the uh, defeat of the evil that is on this earth today. Now we see what happens. I heard a great voice of much people. There they are, the saints, now assembled. The church. The church has been called away. If you read Revelation chapters 1 through 3, you'll see it talks about the church, the church, the church, the church. But when you get to chapter 4, John says, I heard a great voice that says, come up here. The rapture occurs and come up here, Jesus says to his bride, he says to his church, he says to you and me, for those of us who have been saved, Jesus says, come up here. And you don't hear the church anymore from chapter 4 all the way to chapter 19. And now in chapter 19, after all these things that has happened, after all of the wrath of God poured out upon the face of the earth, after all of the evil society has literally been set to smoke because of the punishment and the judgment of God, now we see the church assembled. Before the, the, the groom, the bride has come, and before the groom, as he looks out upon them, they begin to shout, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Those who are redeemed by the blood of the, of the Lamb. Those who have been, have been forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. A great multitude, John said, is a symbol there. Every soul that has been saved. Every time a, a head goes under in baptism, we ought to shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise be unto God. And so now we see here in this text today what we're going to see Today, what we're going to look at is the final act of our salvation. You say, well, preacher, you always said that our salvation is complete. It is. It is complete in so many ways. But now, you remember I've always told you, remember, I have been saved. I am being saved. I will be saved. The completion of our salvation comes at the wedding, at the marriage of the Lamb, when I understand, when I see now in these scriptures, the culmination of our, of our dedication, of our commitment, of our engagement, if you want to call it that, to the Lord Christ. And now comes the time for the wedding. Praise him for our salvation is complete when we pass these verses in chapter 19. But in our lives today, yes, we're already sealed, no doubt about that. But in the text here, he is he's describing the completion of the marriage. In verses 2 and 3, you see he says, True and righteous are the judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth. Oh my goodness. With her fornication hath avenged the blood of his servants now at her hand. God is not overlooking the evil in this world today. God is not just turning his back and, 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 and allowing this stuff to go on because he's enjoying it or overlooking it or letting it go. It's not going away. It's going to be judged. And he says, again, they begin to shout, hallelujah, as there's smoke, the smoke of the evil ones and the punishment of God upon them. Are you ready to praise God for the day that Satan is finally judged? Are you not ready? Are you not some days just literally agonizing and shouting, Hallelujah, God, please come quickly. God, please judge this 
evil that I see in this world today. Are you not ready? Are you not ready to see the smoke of the judgment, of the punishment upon this evil society, of this evil that's going on in our world today? Are you not ready to see it judged and to see it come to an end? Are you not ready to praise God? To praise God for what we see and we know that it's coming. It's just, a, it's just a step away. It's so near that God is going to pour out his wrath upon the evil of mankind and upon Satan and his minions and upon those who wreak havoc in this world today. This is the day that God is describing to us in Revelation chapter 19. This is the day when evil is finally judged. When it finally comes the day when God says, I have had enough, and the dam of God's grace turns loose, and the wrath of God comes rushing in, judged as the day is finally poured out upon those on this earth, judged as the wrath of God, which is pure justice. This is not just anger of God. It's the wrath of God, but it's controlled wrath. It's pure wrath. It's real wrath, and it's pure judgment. Jesus is going to return. And when Jesus comes back, listen carefully so that you don't have any mistaking of your understanding. When Jesus returns, he's not coming back to Calvary. He's not coming back to a cross. He's not coming back as a lamb. He's coming back as a lion of pure justice. He's coming back as a lion who's going to step his feet upon this old earth and pour out as the wrath of God brings justice and judgment upon the evil of our day. You remember over there, we read this sometimes at Christmas time, over the book of Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Isaiah said, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Christmas, yes. We, we, we read that. We love that at Christmas. But listen to verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with justice, uh, judgment and justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The promise, the vow of God that Jesus is going to return again. Yes, he came once. A child was born. A child was given unto us for our salvation. Unto us he brought his, himself into this world to be a perfect sacrifice so that I could find righteousness that I did not have. I have read that over and over again, and I love it every time I read it. But listen, this day he speaks of also in Isaiah as well as in Revelation. The day of judgment, of justice, is coming. And of his kingdom when he returns, there will be no end. There will be no end. Christ himself is going to come back. He is going to judge the wicked. He's going to judge the evil. And he's going to judge the evil one. Trust me, the evil one, Satan himself, whom I would love if I was strong enough and man enough and good enough, just literally put my fingers around his throat and strangle him until he could speak no more. That evil one, Satan, is going to be judged finally and forever. The mighty hand of Christ is going to come upon his head. The justice of God is going to fall. And that seducing spirit of Satan that you and I deal with, that our children deal with, that our society deals with, that seducing spirit, the Bible says, is going to be destroyed before us. He's going to be judged before us. He's going to be put in his place before us. Now, do you know that that seducing spirit is around you today? Think about it. We have discussed, you and I, many of you, have discussed so many things that brings tears to our eyes as we see what the seducing spirit is doing to our children, to our babies, to our teenagers, to our college kids. We do our dead level best to raise them right, to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And they go out into this old evil society and that seducing spirit begins to get his hands on them and he begins to weave his wicked ways into their minds and to strangle their minds with his enticements to the point to where they fall into the hands of lifestyles that is so evil that it is absolutely sickening when we 
really think about it. He is seducing. He is deceiving us. Every day, the same spirit of Satan that seduced or tried, tried to seduce the Lord Jesus Christ, is seducing our young people today by the millions into believe, getting them to believe his lies, into getting them to fall into his hands and falling into hell and destruction because of what he's doing to them. I despise him with everything that's in my body and soul. I despise when I even have a thought of him. Believe me and trust me when Jesus gives us his solemn promise in Revelation 19, he will be judged. And he will be judged by the awesome and mighty hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will be judged. He will be judged when the powerful judgment of Christ comes upon his head and upon his society. And we will be witnesses to the smoke of their torment as it literally rises up off of this earth. We will see it as the evil spirits of this earth, as the minions of Satan who have deceived others and have tried to deceive us and have done their best to lead us astray. We will see as their smoke ascends up from the earth. And what will we do? The Bible says we will shout what? Hallelujah! Praise God! Aren't you ready to do that? Aren't you ready to look him dead in the eyes of Satan and say, Hallelujah, because my Jesus is coming. Aren't you ready? The satanic systems of this society are going to fall into complete destruction when Satan gets it, when Christ gets his hand on Satan. And he's going, he's going to come. He's going to make it happen. In verse 4 of chapter 19, it says, The four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne. And what did they say? They said, Amen, Amen. What does Amen mean? Amen simply means I agree. Hallelujah, do it. Yes, yes, yes. I give you my confirmation. I give you my firm belief and power behind me. I agree. Amen. Hallelujah. That's what the four and twenty elders will say. Who are they? Well, the four living creatures, he said. The four living creatures are the four of the most awesome, most powerful cherubims, angels of heaven. They are the most powerful forces uh, next to Jesus Christ in heaven. The four living creatures. I don't think creatures is a good word in our modern language only because we associate it in a different way. But the truth is he's talking about powerful, wonderful angels. Then he speaks also of the 24 elders. The 24 elders, the 4 and 20 elders are the, are the saints of God, of the church, and of the Christians, and of the believers, all the way from Pentecost until the day of the rapture. He's talking about the 12 who are the, uh, the, the old patriarchs of the Old Testament who affirm, amen, hallelujah, we believe the Lord Christ of the New Testament. The New Testament saints, the 12 apostles, and then all of us who come together represented before the throne of God by the saints of all time as we ourselves gather together. And what do we say? In agreement together, we all, Jew and Gentile alike, all of us of every race and every creed, everyone who's ever bowed the knee before Christ and received him as Savior will agree together as one. No longer will there be this division. No longer will there be all of this fussing and scrambling and backbiting and all of that mess that goes on in so many places today. All of that will be gone, and all together, God says, we will say amen, amen, and hallelujah. Here we are in the heavenly realms as we, the earthly, the saints of time, have come together to shout hallelujah. Can you, can you, can you right now say amen to the worship of our Lord Jesus Christ? Can you, one in agreement, say before God amen to your holy word? Amen to your actions, Father. Amen to our Savior and Lord. Let me tell you, you might want to go ahead and start practicing. <laughs> you might better start practicing. Because one day, I'm telling you, listen, one of these days when this day comes, you're going to want to shout amen with all the strength that you have from your toenails to the end of your last hair on your head. You're going to want to put all the force you've got into it. You're going to want to look into the beautiful eyes of Jesus Christ and say, Amen. Hallelujah to my Savior. 
Oh, get ready, folks. It's going to be great. I'm telling you, heaven, <laughs> heaven's going to get loud. So go ahead and get ready. Adjust yourself. Take your nerve pill because Jesus is on the throne. Listen, Jesus is on the throne. And when we behold him, oh, dear God, when we behold him, what we will see, what we will see will be the absolute perfection of the beauty of the one who died for me the one who died and rose again so that he could bring me and present me to his father as his bride. Don't let the lies of Satan deceive you. Don't let the lies of Satan hold you back. Look into the eyes of Jesus today, in your mind, in your heart, in your bed, in your field, in your living room, on the job. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen to the Lord Jesus Christ. For he is faithful. He is faithful. And when he tells us, that this is going to happen. It's going to happen. And it's closer than you think. We're so near to this wonderful day of heaven's celebration. What a wedding it's going to be. What a wedding. Okay, ladies, get ready. What a wedding it's going to be in heaven when Christ destroys Satan's evil. When, when Christ destroys the evil society of this earth that we deal with today, when Christ destroys the evil system that Satan is working so hard to set up and the kingdom of Christ comes into its fullness there with the Lord Jesus Christ together forever, you won't be able to do anything but shout hallelujah. Hallelujah, praise God. I can't wait. Oh, but listen, let me tell you something. There's a great thing. There's a great thing to be a Christian today. Are you ready? It's a great thing to be a Christian. Hang in there, man of God. Hang in there, woman of God. Hang in there, parent, who's doing the best you know to raise those kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Hang in there, grandparents, uncles, and aunts. Hang in there, Mr. and Miss Christian, because I'm telling you, you're on the right side. Don't get discouraged. Lift up your head because your redemption draweth nigh. It is right around the corner. Jesus is already tuning up. The angels are already getting ready. The Father is still watching with intention for the moment <laughs> that he will say, go and get my children. Oh, boy. I ought to be able to get an amen out of that for sure. Woo, come on now. Hallelujah, praise my Lord's name. I'm telling you right now, I can't wait. The day evil will be dealt with. The day the church is now assembled in its purity, in its readiness for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And with every ounce of pain, with every drop of sorrow, with every tear that falls from my eye, I am reminded in this evil world today of this glorious day that's coming when we, the church, are going to be presented by Christ to Christ in front of the Father. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, Homer, me and you will get, we'll get in the spirit, boy. Let me tell you, it's exciting. All right, you ready? Here's the wedding. Look at verse 7. Let us be glad. No, listen, don't you get lackadaisical about this. Be glad. Let us be glad and rejoice. Let us give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now, Jesus, ready to present the bride to himself. Ready to present the bride for the time of the, of the wedding accompaniment that has been assembled. The earthly weddings on this old earth, I've done many of them. The, the, the attention of a wedding. Have you, ever, have you ever watched all that old groom, you bring him out and he steps up here and maybe we up here on this podium together, me and that old groom, he's kind of looking. You know, he got that little sheepish grin on his face because he knows she's out there somewhere and she's fixing to come and he's ready to see her. You know what I mean? He's standing up here and everybody's looking at the groom, Right? Kind of looking at the groom, but what happens? Bah, 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 bah. Then what? Here she comes. All the attention is on that beautiful bride. Have you ever noticed how pretty a bride is? Have you ever seen an ugly bride? Don't answer. <laughs> you got to look hard. There ain't many of them. But, <laughs> but the bride, it's her most beautiful day of her life. She comes down that aisle and everybody's looking at her. 
Everybody's just smiling from ear to ear. All the attention on that beautiful bride. But let me tell you something. At this wedding, it's different. At this wedding, all of the attention is on the groom. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, uh, 27, the Bible says that he might present unto himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it might be holy and without blemish. Here comes the bride. Here comes the church. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I pray, deep within me comes up, I just can't seem to stop it from coming up when I feel in myself the, the unworthiness to even open my mouth to talk to the Father or to even bow my knee before Him. But He invites me to come and He invites me to pray. And as I do, I feel the spots, the wrinkles, the blemishes in my life, they are so prominent and so prevalent. But in that day, they won't be there. They will not be there whatsoever. He says that I might present, I might present this bride, this beautiful church that has now been assembled without any spot. And ladies, are you ready? No wrinkles. You ain't got no makeup that'll do that, okay? Just hang in there. But you will, when we come before him, every spot, every wrinkle, every flaw, every blemish will be gone. Oh, 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 to see this day. To see this day. Don't, listen, don't give up on the church. I know sometimes we get frustrated. And sometimes folks in the church, they'll say bad things about one another. And I never have understood that. I cannot understand how in the world anybody, anybody, could have anything bad to say about the church. Don't give up on the church. One day, one day, Jesus is going to present us perfect in heaven. Perfect in heaven. Perfect before himself. Perfect before the Father. And there will be. God's not through with the church yet. God's not through with the church yet. Hang in there. Here's something that's kind of personal for me now. I'm going to, I've, I've got to give it to you. Just give me a minute. This is personal from me to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. Paul, speaking to the church that he helped to found, and he said, For I am jealous over you. I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present, that I may present you to Christ as a chaste virgin. Oh, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Have you ever wondered why? Now, now listen, it, it, I'm talking about a real pastor. Now, I'm not just talking about a money drawer. I'm not talking about someone who just stands up in the pulpit and repeat after me. I'm talking about a real pastor with a pastor's heart. Have you ever wondered why a pastor can be so upset, so upset, so brokenhearted when one of his church members messes up? Have you ever wondered why a pastor can get so upset or disturbed when one of his church folks wanders off, wanders off into unfaithfulness and starts to get slack and starts to get less and less enthusiastic about the Lord and starts to fade away. Have you ever wondered why that old pastor sheds tears in the darkness of the night over names of people that he calls? Have you ever wondered? Here's why. Here's why, because it's my job. It's my job as your pastor to seal your engagement to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's my job as your pastor to bring you to the point where I can present you myself to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's my job. The Bible tells me so. It's my job to prepare you for that presentation here in Revelation spoken of. That's why when I weep over you, that's why when I come to you and I, and I love on you and I let you know how much I love you and I try to nurture you back into a right relationship with Christ. Listen, it's my job. It's what I've got to do. It's what my heart said. It's what Christ calls me to do. In that Eastern culture, <laughs> when this book was written, there were three steps, three steps that had to happen when a person was engaged or spoused before the wedding could ever happen. Now, to break an engagement or an espousal back in those days was the same as a divorce would be, even today. It's the same thing, but it's different in the way it happens. 
Because in those days, parents would get together. Parents would commit this little girl, probably anywhere from nine to ten years old, somewhere in that neighborhood. They would present her to another little nine-year, ten-year-old boy. And they would make an agreement between themselves as parents. She belongs to him. He belongs to her. And there would be the espousal. The kids didn't make the choice. It was an arranged wedding. Yes. You say, oh, that's horrible. That's terrible. No, no, you better listen. You better listen because I, I'm telling you, it, this makes me happy. My marriage to Jesus is an arranged marriage. God looked down upon this earth and in spite of how rotten and low down I was, God looked at me and he wanted me to marry his son. He wanted me to be a part of the bride that would come to this wedding. In those days, the children would come together and listen, they would marry anywhere from 12 to 14 years old. Look out, Will. I <laughs> got his attention. Well, I guarantee you. It's about time for you to get married, boy. <laughs> when they get married, it would be 12 to 14 years old. Espoused. Because their parents agreed together. My marriage to Christ is an arranged marriage. God looked down and chose me. The Bible says none of us, none of us went looking for him. None of us in our hearts were just dying to run around and try to find him. Instead, the Bible says, God looked down upon us and God himself sent his spirit, his Holy Spirit, to woo and to draw us unto his son, to tell us about Jesus so that in some way, somehow, we would be a spouse to be married to his son as I was. When I got saved, the espousal occurred. When I got saved, when I received Christ as my Savior, I was then at that moment, I was a spouse to him, to be married to him. The bride then would remain in the father's house, her father's house, until the time of the wedding. Now, there would be no physical activity. There would be no getting together and courting and dating and doing all that stuff. They were espoused. They were already guaranteed to come together and everyone in the community knew it. No physical relation, no living together. It was until the day. And then one day, the, bride, the groom, the groom would get his groomsmen together and he would come marching down to the bride's house. What had happened was he'd gone back to his father's house and he had prepared for them a place to live. He had gotten things ready, prepared for the wedding, prepared for the day when she could come and go home with him. And so he goes now with his entourage. Big parade. Lights and torches up and down Main Street, man. We're coming down to the house of the bride, and there they are. There they are. The bride had to be ready at any moment because he might show up any time. And here he comes. What a celebration. And then comes the wedding. <laughs> the bride would now unite with the, with the groom, and they would go to the marriage. And at the marriage, what a, what a feast. It would go on for days. For days they would celebrate. For days they would eat nanner pudding. For days they would have such a... When I got saved, listen, I was a spouse right then to Christ. Right now I'm in that phase. I'm waiting for his return. I'm waiting for him to come again and to receive me unto myself. That where he is, there I may be also. Today he is preparing a place for me that he can come and receive me unto himself. He gave me the guarantee of my espousal to him when he planted within me. He gave me the earnest, that means the guarantee of the Holy Spirit to live within me. The Holy Spirit to tell me about Jesus. For every turn of my life, the Holy Spirit rejoices within me to show me Jesus Christ and what Christ is doing for me. And what a groom. What a groom that's going to come get me. For over 50 years now, I've been espoused to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For that day comes, all right, are you ready? The marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. What do you mean made ready? First, Jesus gave me. He imputed unto me. That means he gave to me. He just put upon me his righteousness. 
That means he covered my sins. That means he made me worthy to be his bride. It doesn't mean he made me perfect because I'm still a human being and I still have that old sin spirit, that sin nature within me and I'm still tempted and I still fall into that temptation occasionally. Don't give up on me, please. But he gave me the Holy Spirit and day by day, faith by faith, step by step, mistake by mistake, I'm growing and getting closer and getting more ready and more ready until one day, one day he's going to come and get me. One day he's going to present me before the Father. That day, that day he is going to impart upon me perfection. Oh, I've got his righteousness today that guarantees my salvation. And that day I'll have his perfection. In that day, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. John says, Beloved, now we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Oh, dear God, come on quickly. Here in this old life, I mess up. I make mistakes, I do stupid stuff, and sometimes I want to slap my own face and even do sometimes. But in heaven, are you ready? If this don't, if this don't get you soup pot, I don't know what it's going to take. One day, one day, in heaven, I will have perfection. Perfect righteousness. Perfect righteousness. To sin no more. I won't even be in a place where sin at all even exists. There will not even be the temptation to exist. Oh, hallelujah. God's still working on me. He's not through with me yet, but let me tell you something. When I step into heaven, God's going to make me like his dear son, Jesus. Perfect. Perfect. (laughs) Without sin. Not just forgiven. That means totally without it. And then what's he going to do? He's going to present us to Christ. He's going to present us to himself. Jesus is going to say, Behold, there is my bride. My dear old grandmother who raised me, I'm telling you the truth, honest to goodness. When I'd go anywhere, it didn't make any difference where we went. She'd say, This is Mike Hall. This is my son. Do you all know Mike Hall? He's my son. Oh, I was her grandson, but she raised me, so I was her son. I got him when he was a year and seven months old. I mean, mama was proud. I never understood why. But she was proud to present me to anybody who would listen and say, this is my boy. In heaven, Jesus is going to say, this is my bride. This is my bride. Church, he's going to look at you and he's going to be so proud to present you before his father to himself. This is my bride. Now, I'll give you just a second. Oh, it ain't even close to time. Wake up because I don't want you to miss this. I'm going to give you something that's real good. I'm not going to charge you any extra, so don't even get the checkbook out, Debbie. It's all right. I want you to hear this. Listen to verse 8. Revelation 19, verse 8. I want you to listen to the latter part of the verse. He says, To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. You can imagine, what am I going to wear? Girls, y'all look through your closet all day and say, I still ain't got nothing to wear. You might have 15 or 20 outfits. It'd be just fine. I ain't got nothing to wear. I got to go get something. Well, listen, Jesus says, here's your garment that you're going to wear when you come to the marriage. Here's what you're going to have on, your bridal gown. He says, you're going to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now, little children, what does he mean? 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. Now, little children, who's he talking to? John, the old pastor, talking to his children, talking to his church. Now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his appearing. I am his child. I am his child. Why in the world would I be ashamed? 
Look at that. They are arrayed in fine linen. For the white linen, the fine linen, is the righteousness of saints. Because the fine linen garment is the clothing that I'll be wearing when I come to the wedding. Woven, woven by the actions of my own life. Made, that garment made from the very material that I gave him to make it out of. Thread by thread, stitch by stitch, my garment that I will wear to the wedding will be woven, will be made by me. It will be given the material to Christ of the life that I have lived, woven by our actions as we endure unto the end, unto the coming of Christ, our faithfulness to God as we try our dead level best to do the best we can in this evil society that we face every day, giving him pleasure. Every time we give God pleasure with our actions, with our lives, with our thoughts, with our desires, every time it gives him another piece of pure white cloth that he can weave into our wedding garments that we will wear that day. Please don't let your garment be tainted or coarse or scratchy, or ugly. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed when you stand before the Father. Only pure white linen will be what I want. Now verse 9, and we're done. He said to me, write, Blessed are they which is called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Jesus from his own mouth said, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this is it. This is gospel. This is what's going to happen. I don't know when he's coming, but I know he is. I know he is. Final word, five seconds. Five seconds after you die. Five seconds after you leave this life, you'll know how you should have lived here. You'll know. Well, preacher, what do I do now? Listen, it's not hard. It's not hard to understand God's word enough to behave yourself and to do right. It's not hard to read God's word and know that God calls you to love him every day. It's not hard to read God's word and know that he calls you to put him first in everything that you do in your life. It's not hard. It's not hard to read God's word and know that to him is the glory, the commitment, the first of it all, the first of our life, the first of ourselves, the first of our love. And remember this, every act of worship you do, every single time you give God glory, every time you do something, for someone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, one more stitch, one more thread is woven into your fine linen for your garment of the wedding day. That's not hard to understand. But every time you miss an opportunity, every time you don't follow God's direction, that wedding garment is a little more blemished. You and I, you and I need to be living our life here because of what an important investment it makes up there. Let's pray. Father, have your way in every heart and every life in this room, in this place right now. Take your word, do with it as you will. In the name of Christ, amen. As our musicians come, as we all stand. I don't know what your need is today. I don't know what you need to do today. But you do, because God has revealed it to you. I don't know what this invitation means to you. Maybe it means you need to bow your head and, and just say, Christ, I'm, I, I'm, I'm recommitting. I'm giving myself in a fresh and new way today. Maybe you need to come and be saved. Maybe you need to come and commit yourself, your life, your all, your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever you need to do, let's get it done as we sing. Open my eyes, Lord, show me. Let me see. That day's coming. 
is so near. Let me see what I can do. Open my eyes. Let me see 